All right, well, good morning and welcome to the Bloomer United Methodist Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It is good to see all of you. For those of you that are worshiping online, we are glad that you are joining us um, and have taken time to worship with us today. Friends, as we begin, as I normally do, I'm going to invite us just to center ourselves, to cast off all of those things that we have brought with us this morning, all of those many things we have yet to do today and in this coming week, and let us just focus all of our senses upon the presence of God in this place this morning. Friends, hear these centering words. Christ, the living stone and cornerstone of our faith, is building us into spiritual houses and a holy priesthood. Let us open ourselves to the master builder. Amen. Friends, at this time, let us join together in our opening songs. The first one is Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It is in your hymnal, number 420, or the words will be on the screen. I invite you to stand if you can comfortably do so this morning.
Friends, I invite you to join me in this opening prayer. Merciful God, our refuge and our strength, train our hearts on the words of your Son. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Feed our souls with your spiritual milk and build our very lives into spiritual houses that neither famine nor storm can shake the foundation of our faith. In the name of the master builder and the living stone we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So a couple of quick announcements to share with all of you. Um, just a reminder that Mary Johnson is collecting items for um, the homeless vets again for Christmas bags. Um, so if you have some items that you would like to donate or you would like to help her put those kits together, uh, I invite you to speak with her. Um, also, we have a number of committee meetings coming up, and so if you are on one of those committees, I invite you to make sure that those are on your calendar and you can plan to attend those. And then for um, the parents and kiddos, we, there is no Kidzillion this week because of a shortened week, so if you have kiddos that are in Kidzillion, just a reminder, we will not have that, so they won't be picked up on Wednesday, so please um, plan to make arrangements for that. Now, I do have one last minute um, announcement that I put in. Um, so this Wednesday at 7 p.m., um, Pastor Tom Stammen is coming in um, to a church in, in Chatech called The Refuge. And I had the opportunity to listen to him a couple of weeks ago. Um, very dynamic guy. He's doing some amazing um, mission and ministry work in the world. Um, and Sarah and I had the opportunity to meet and talk with him, and we, we partnered with him financially to support what he's doing. But he is um, creating what he calls cities of refuge, and he has a large one down in Honduras. And um, basically, he's, he's bringing in orphans, uh, people who are dealing with sex trafficking and violence, and he's creating safe sanctuaries for these people. And then he's also creating businesses um, that allow this, these, these places to be self-sustaining. Um, and he's doing such a good job with it that some of the universities in, in Honduras are actually coming to learn um, from the way that he is doing some of the farming and different things. Um, so if you have the opportunity to go up and listen to him, I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, he, it's pretty amazing, and I think you would be quite interested in what he's doing. I'm also considering the possibility of seeing what it would be like for our church to do a mission trip with him at some point in the future. And so, again, if you can make it up there, it's at the Refuge at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. <clears throat> All right. Well, let us continue our worship with our young disciples. I suppose. <laughs> so as you know, we had um, invited any and all who want to read the Bible cover to cover or however you're going to choose to read it. Um, we did in our little handout or flyer added um, that we would start meeting monthly. It's called um, Bible cover to cover meeting. Um, we are planning to do that every second Sunday of the month at the LTC Center. And it starts at three. Uh, we have a prayer walk around the city of Bloomer for that first hour. And then the second hour we come together in fellowship um, and we're gonna let God and Spirit lead kind of what that gets to look like. We don't necessarily go through all the questions or any formal way of going through the Bible uh, readings, um, but we'll see how that looks. So today we do have that, we kind of moved that from last week. So if anybody would want to join, even just to kind of get a little flavor of what that looks like, please join us at the LTC Center today at three, and then moving forward from there, it will be the second Sunday of every month at the same location and same time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I'll bring my young disciples up. Come on down.
All right, so how are you guys doing today? Good. Yeah, you're looking good. All right, so I got a really important question for you guys today. If God called you to go start a church somewhere, what would you do? You'd go start it? Oh, that's good. That's a really good first start, right? You'd go. That's, that's very important. But once you got there to the spot that God called you to start the church, what would you do, Colin? Um, I would pray for God. You'd pray? That's important. What else would you do if you had to start a church? Charlie? Okay, so maybe you'd have to find a spot, a building, or a house, okay? And you might put certain things in it. What, what things would you put in it? Okay, so a piano, maybe a cross, some candles. What else did you say? Seeds. Okay, so you could have some flowers and different stuff. That'd be cool. Oh, seats. Okay, that makes a whole lot more sense, but... So yeah, you need some seats, either some chairs or some pews, okay? But you could have seeds too. I like the idea of having flowers. What else would you do? Hug Jesus. What would you bring in? I would bring in a present. Okay, a present. Evie, what would you, how, if God told you to go build a church or start a church, what would you do? Oh, she got shy. All right. Well... If you got, so first you get there, then you get a building, you put a few things in it, what else do you need? You need some, you need some like spirit of God. Yep, you need the Holy Spirit. Yep, the Holy Spirit's got to be in the building. What about? People. You got to have some people, right? Because that's really what the church is. So how do you go out and get people to come be part of your church? Tell everybody, and how do you do that? Okay, um, how how would you get people to come to your church? Spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel. What does that mean? Yeah, right. And what else can you do besides tell the story of God? What's another really important piece? To learn about God, but what is God? What about what God's done in your life, right? That's called your testimony. Okay, it's the story of the things God has done in your life. Okay, so why do you think I asked you this question? If you could start a church, what would you do? Why do you think I asked you that question? Because so you know what to do to build a church. And why would why would that be important? Right? But this is what you're going to get to do in the future, right? Okay, you're going to get to, one day you're going to get to build a church. Or you're going to get to be a part of a church. Right? So maybe one day if you stay here in Bloomer, you might just stay here. And maybe you'll use your gifts and skills and share with the church. Right? Maybe God, when, when you grow up, Maybe you'll go and move to a different town and you'll find a new church. Maybe some of you will go out and start a church because God will say, you know what, Charlie, I need you to go start a church over here in this town or in this country. And then we got to go and we got to do that. So right now, you guys already are starting to get some of the skills to be part of the church, but also to start your own church. Okay, And our job, the rest of our job, is to help you continue to develop those skills because one day all of us are going to be all gray-haired and old and you guys are going to be the ones coming up and leading the church and taking us where we need to go. Some of you guys are going to be offering up prayers. Some of you are going to be preaching. Some of you are going to be going on mission trips. Okay, And you're going to share God's love with the world. Okay? So let me pray for you guys, and I want you to think about how God's calling you to learn and share your gifts right now, and how maybe where God's calling you to go in the future, okay? All right. 
Well, dear God, we just thank you so much for these young disciples, and we thank you for their faith. We thank you for what you are already calling them to do in their lives. Lord, we know that these young disciples are, are powerful. The Holy Spirit is moving and guiding them, and they're already sharing their gifts for ministry with us, and we thank you for that. Lord, we just pray that this church continues to come around to support and nurture um, their development, their faith as they continue to grow. And Lord, just make these young disciples into a powerful new generation of, of people who love Jesus and who are excited to grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, at this time, I'm going to invite us to join together in the giving and receiving of our tithes and our offerings. If I can have one of my young disciples bring the offering plate up, I'm going to have the rest of you please stand if you comfortably do so as we sing our doxology together. Dear gracious and loving God, we thank you and praise you for these tithes and these offerings, and we thank you for the generous hearts of each and every one of the givers. Lord, we ask that you would continue to grow and multiply these gifts to be used to, to fund your ministry and mission of this church and this local community, and also to go out and to serve those that are in need in our community and in our world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated once again. <clears throat> All right, friends, I've got a series of questions for you this morning, and I don't need a, an answer or a raise of hands for these, but I do want you to really deeply consider um, these questions. So how many of you have ever invited someone to church and they actually came? How many of you have ever led someone to the Lord? How many of you have ever discipled someone? How many of you are currently doing one or more of these things right now? And... What would it look like if you did these things on a daily basis as part of your lifestyle? Okay? So, friends, we are going to continue on in our series on discipleship called the Ephesus Model, and we're, we're looking at what it means to be a disciple in church. Okay? And so I want to read to you... Um, uh, a passage from the, the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. It says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. There were about 12 of them in all. 
Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate and refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, and they had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for about two years so that all of the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All right, friends. So as we begin to unpack this, last the, a couple of weeks ago when we started this series, I talked to you about some of these different stages that Pastor Bill Hull had lifted up for discipleship. And if you remember them, I'll go through them really quick. The first one is come and see, right? It's for the seekers, people who don't know Jesus and are, are just thinking about or considering what it means to give their lives to Christ. Okay, the second one, the second stage is called come and follow me, right? And this is where, you know, people say, okay, I, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to begin to move in and, and to start down the road of being a disciple, and I'm going to start sharing my gifts um, as I discern them, right? The third stage is come and be with me, right? This is where you really take your discipleship to a deeper level and you actually begin to disciple others at the same time that you grow um, in your discipleship. And then fourth is this remain in me, where we remain in Christ and are basically sent back out into the world, <clears throat> excuse me, to go and do the things that Jesus taught us to do. Okay, So I selected this passage today because the church at Ephesus, I think, really gives us the best biblical example of what it looks like to be a discipling church. Okay, And <clears throat> Paul spent significant time at the church of Ephesus. I honestly want to say it's probably the longest he spent in any one area other than Rome at the end of his life. Okay, And we know that Paul has traveled far and wide, right? I mean, this guy has covered basically from the east all the way through the northern part of the Mediterranean, all right? And so he's, he's a mover and a shaker, and yet something causes him to stop in Ephesus. And so in the story we just read, we would say that Paul is in his third missionary journey, and he comes from the east, and he stops in this town of Ephesus, Okay, later on in the scriptures, Paul will write a letter to the Ephesians, right? And he'll talk about the personality, the character of the church at Ephesus, and he'll also talk about the priorities of this disciple making church, and we'll look at those in the coming weeks. And then finally, he also writes later in his letter what are called the pastoral letters, right? He writes to Timothy explaining what it means to be in pastoral leadership, and he tells Timothy, who is now the lead pastor, if you will, at the church of Ephesus, how to continue to develop in his leadership and to disciple the church, all right? So as we begin to look into our scripture today, again, we see Paul being very active, right? He, he comes into Ephesus, he's been here before, but he starts this very familiar pattern, and that is he begins to look for people that he can minister to. Okay? Now, friends, in many ways, that's an important concept in and of itself, right? It says, there he found some disciples, right? Paul doesn't go up and he doesn't sit down on the, gate, on the stairs of the synagogue and go, gosh, I hope somebody comes and talks to me today. I hope somebody comes and I get to talk to Jesus about them, right? And then people stream by and he just keeps sitting there, right? That's not the way it works, right? Paul actively goes out and begins to search for people that think like him, that already believe in Jesus. Now, the immediate question is, why would he do that? What's so important about finding people that believe the same way anyway? Well, let's see how many of you are Robert Kiyosaki uh, readers, okay? So what's the difference between someone that's self-employed and a business owner? The person that's self-employed is by themselves, and they can only do as much work as that one person can do. A business owner has hired other people to help do more work, right? There's leverage in having other people partner with you or work for you. 
So let's take an example of a construction job, right? So if this self-employed carpenter or con <clears throat> construction worker goes and, and says, you know what, I can do this house and it'll take me a week to do this job, right? He can't go do any other jobs because he's stuck for that one week doing that job. But if he hires a couple of people, teaches them his craft, he can now say, guess what? You two guys or girls can work on this project while I come over here and work on this one. And if he continues, he or she continues to expand, pretty soon he, they can do lots of business, lots of projects, right? And so friends, we need to think of discipleship, one, as a form of leverage, right? Because I can't go out and talk to everybody in the world. Neither can you. Right? How many people do you think you know in your life? Hundreds? Thousands? Maybe more? Right? Now think about that. Now how many people that you know do I know? Probably just a small fraction. Right? So God has put you and connected you with people that I'm not connected with. And likewise for me and for everyone else. Now, if we're doing our job as disciples, guess what? We can now reach a whole lot more people because we're leveraging each other. And when it comes back to the church, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we also understand that we can leverage each other's gifts, right? Deb has gifts that I don't have. And so when I need her to pray or to do something for me based on her spiritual gifts, I can come say, hey, I've got somebody. Can you talk to them? Can you pray for them? Or I can go back to Jess and I say, Jess, you've got some spiritual gifts that we don't have. I've got some people that really have some needs. Could you come and minister to them? Right? And we begin to work together as a church and leverage each other, both to reach new people, but also to minister and to care for them as they show up in our lives. <clears throat> Now, there is this part, this second part, where Paul not only establishes the church, right? He, he finds these 12 people, and he begins to disciple them, right? He essentially establishes his church. <clears throat> now, he goes about, I think, and he does not what, what I would call an assessment, right? He begins to assess their gifts. He begins to assess their understanding and their beliefs, now, the scriptures don't tell us why, but somewhere in this assessment, Paul comes to discern that these guys don't have a proper, I shouldn't say a proper, they don't have a full understanding of baptism, right? Because it says, he asked them at some point, well, have you guys received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they go, well, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And he says, well, whose baptism were you baptized to? And he, they say, John's, all right? And so then Paul goes on to offer this deeper understanding of what it means to be baptized. Forgive me, I'm losing my voice here, guys. Ooh, now I don't have any taste buds. So he offers this deeper understanding, okay? Now, friends, one of the things that I think is really important for us is that it's important to remember that God continually calls us deeper, too. He calls us into deeper relationship. God calls us to deeper understanding. And sometimes we grow and we understand things that, you know, we, we look back and we go, gosh, you know, I, I thought I knew this, and then all of a sudden I got this, this new thing that I learned. I have this deeper understanding. Now, friends, one of the, the great ministry or, or worship songs that I love is the song by Hillsong, Oceans, Where My Feet May Fail, right? And it's kind of based off the story of Peter walking out on the water, right? And it says, you know, God, just call me out under the water where my feet may fail, right? And it says, take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith may be made stronger in the presence of my Savior, Right? I love that. Like that, that chorus just tears me up as I think about, gosh, there's so much joy. There's so much that Jesus has to offer, and yet so many of the times I just want to sit in the boat, right? I don't want to take the step out, or I want to try to control everything and say, you know, I don't, I don't want to take that risk, or what if people reject me, or what if I do this? But God continually says, Josh, I want more of you. Debbie, I want more of you. Jan, I want more of you. Come be with me. 
Let me show you what I have to offer you. Come and experience the joy of being in my presence. And guess what? I'm going to blow you away with what I'm going to do through you. And so, friends, Paul disciples these people, and he says, okay, guys, you need a fuller understanding of this baptism because John offered you a baptism of repentance. But Jesus is the Messiah, and he came to not only offer a way for the forgiveness of sins, but he also gives you this promise of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, friends, I could obviously spend multiple sermons talking about baptism, but there's two points that I want to talk about really quickly. And the first one is that as we remember our baptisms, whether our baptisms happens when we were infants or whether we were baptized later in life, right, the, the ritual significance of some of the things is deeply profound, right? This idea that when we're immersed in the water or the water is sprinkled over us, that we die to our old selves and we are raised to new life in Christ, right? We're a new creation in Christ. And there's transformation that occurs because of that. And so, friends, we need to remember that we too are called to continually be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that requires that we get discipled. Right? Even me as a pastor, I need to be discipled. I need to continue to grow in my faith. So I ask you, who today is discipling you? Or what are you doing to be discipled by other people? Right? And that can look a whole bunch of different ways. Right? Maybe you have somebody here in the church and you're discipling them and you have that relationship. Maybe at some point you'll come to me and I can teach you a couple of things here or there. Maybe you go online because you find someone that's just really influential to you and you feel like their teaching is really sound and really good and you allow yourself to be discipled by them. But friends, our call is to continue to be transformed, to continue to grow, to continue to be deeper. The second thing is that when it comes to baptism, especially for for those that come a little bit later in life, right? When you come and you're able to make that declaration for yourself, you stand before your congregation and you profess that Jesus is Lord, right? And that in itself is important. And this is what I think these guys are missing, right? They understand they had to be baptized for repentance to be made right, but they didn't equate baptism with being able to say, you what, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, And they now have that fuller understanding. And because of that, Paul equips them with what I think is one of the most invaluable weapons that each of us possesses. And that is the power of our testimony. Right? It's the story of what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. And again, friends, as individuals, it looks different for each and every one of us. Now here's the thing. Your testimony is important because it opens the door for you to share Jesus' love and grace with those hundreds or those thousands of people that you know and are connected to. And even if you're only connected to a few people, it opens the door to speak into their lives. Okay? Secondly, as we know in in some of our affirmation statements with baptism, it also speaks to us about using our gifts and providing service and presence in the lives of other people. Right? So we are called to this deep understanding of baptism. And with that, Paul equips these guys to go out and to do ministry into the world. Now, friends, as we look at... As we look at the model of the church, we would pretty much say that that Paul is operating with these 12 new disciples somewhere between the, the come follow me and the come be with me stage, right? The second and third stages. Because obviously these guys believe they're already out there in the town of Ephesus doing something. And he now says, come be with me, come follow me, let me disciple you and I'll show you what it is that you need to do. And so Paul then initiates this very familiar strategy, right? One of the very first things he does in almost every town that he goes to is he goes to the synagogue first, right? He goes to the Jews because that's where he can relate best, right? As a previous Pharisee, as someone who grew up in that context, right? It's easiest to go to those people first because you know 
the traditions, you know the history, even if they're in a different country, it's still you have a connection there based on that context. And so he goes to the synagogue and he, he doesn't just leave the guys back at the, the church or the house or wherever they are. Right? He says, no, come with me. We're going to the synagogue and you're going to watch what I do. And guess what? I'm going to try to let you do what I do. And so Paul goes to the synagogue and for two months he sits there and preaches persuasively about the kingdom of God. In the meantime, his disciples are watching the interactions. Right? Think about a little kid, Right? Think about, especially if you're a parent, this is so annoying, right? Think about how many things they see, right? They catch you when you're at your absolute worst, right? Because they are always watching. Now, hopefully they catch you at some of your best times too, and you go, oh, that's what you need to, to focus on, right? But friends, this is what the disciples get to do. They get to sit and watch Paul minister and evangelize in the synagogue for two months. Well, like many times, the Jews get kind of tired of Paul, and they say, okay, Paul, we're done with you. You head on out and go do something else and leave us alone. So Paul leaves the synagogue, but does he stop? Does he just throw his hands up and go, oh, this God-forsaken city, I'm out of here? Right? Now, there are times that I have to admit I can be like that. I just go, oh, right? And then I just think of how many times God would call, probably call me a stiff-necked person, right? There's that constant in the Old Testament, you stiff-necked people, you. I just hear that ring out over and over again. But then Paul takes him to this lecture hall, right? And, and we don't know a lot about the lecture hall of Tyrannus. There's just not a lot of information. But on one of the Greek manuscripts, it says that Paul went there and, and lectured or he preached for this period between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., right? And that makes sense because it's the hottest part of the day. People would go there for lunch. They would take a rest, and they could come to this place and listen to people speak. Now, Luke, interestingly, says Paul goes there daily, right? And some of us might just think that that's an exaggeration, except for the fact that if we know Paul and we know how zealous he is, I probably believe literally he was there daily. And if he, would, if he could preach for four hours, he was going to take all four hours and preach, right? And so for two years, he goes to this lecture hall and he preaches to the people, right? And he gets that opportunity to, to minister, to evangelize, to share with the people about God's kingdom, about God's love and God's grace. All the meanwhile, the disciples are learning from him. Now let me ask you this. How many sermons have you guys heard in your lifetime? Have you learned a thing or two from them? Right? I mean, even, even if I just do a rough estimate, right? In six years, let's say I've done 300 sermons. Right? Many of you have heard far more sermons than that. Right? Even I've heard more sermons than that than what I've given. Now, do you think it's possible that you could go out and teach some of the things that you've heard along the way? Right? So many of us sell ourselves short and we go, oh, I could never do what that pastor does. I could never do what that evangelist does. You know, I'm no Billy Graham. I couldn't stand. But guess what? Could you get a group of two or three friends and could you share something you learned from your sermon? Could you get up in front of a small group, in front of a Bible study, and preach and teach something? Right? Like, I've heard some of the things that come out of your mouths, and I go, I'm starting to go, that would preach pretty well. Right? That's a pretty good sermon. You better start writing that one up so you can share it. Because here's the thing, friends. I understand that in our denomination and in the hierarchy of, of religion itself, we, we tend to put this emph emphasis on, on education and you got to have certain credentials and stuff. But look, when I read the scriptures, Jesus goes out and finds fishermen, right? Not the most eloquent people, right? As I look at Paul, he comes and grabs normal, everyday people, and he begins to disciple them to do the exact same thing that he's doing. So friends, don't sell yourself short about the fact that you can't preach, that you can't teach, that you can't share your testimony with somebody else. Because you can, and you need to. Because there might be somebody out there that's just dying for help. Maybe they're too afraid to even ask. 
but you have the opportunity to share and shed God's love and grace in their life, to be that light in that dark moment. And friends, all of us have spiritual gifts, right? Because just as when these guys get the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the fuller understanding of baptism, right? Immediately some spiritual gifts manifest. They start speaking in tongues. They start prophesying, right? Each of you has specific gifts that God has given you. And maybe you don't speak in tongues. Maybe you don't prophesy, but you can pray. You can preach. You can teach. You can do service. You can be a friend, you have the gift of hospitality. You have the gift, the gift of helping or of administration. Right Now, in a couple of weeks or in a week, I'm going to give you a spiritual gifts inventory. For, for some of you, maybe you don't know what your gifts are. And I want to give you the opportunity to maybe just consider what they might be. If you already know what your spiritual gifts are, then you don't need to do it great, good, and just move past it. But I want to let make sure people understand that they have gifts because, again, part of being the church, being a discipling church, is that we can share those gifts with each other and that we can share those gifts out in the world that we live. Now, here's the thing, friends. Paul, in moving to the lecture hall, does something very important. He goes where the people are. Right? Just like he doesn't sit down at the stairs of the synagogue and wait for people to happen, he doesn't just take these 12 guys and go sit in this little house and stay there the entire time. He goes out where the people are to do ministry. Now, friends, I want you to deeply consider this. Like, Think about this question, because I'm being serious. Where are the people in this community? Maybe they're on the golf course, although it's getting kind of late in the year, pretty cold. Maybe they're at a sporting event for their kid. Maybe they're at home sleeping. Right? But friends, we need to go where the people are because that's what Christ did. That's what Paul does. And we need to go out and we need to share that. Now, what's interesting here is Paul said that this went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now, friends, again, I would be most likely, if this wasn't Paul, I would likely think that this is probably an exaggeration. All the people in Asia Minor. But Paul understands something very important. He understands, one, because he's so passionate about reaching people for Jesus, but he's also discipling people to go out. And I honestly believe that they could. Because I have to believe to be a disciple for Paul, guess what? You're just not going to get to sit on your hands with him. Right? He's going to make you move. He's going to hold you accountable. He's going to say, get out there and preach. Get out there and share your testimony with someone. Go help someone. Go serve someone. And friends, that's my call for us today, to continue to step into it. Because again, friends, how many people are there in this town? 3,500 I bet there's pretty close to 35 of us in this place this morning. So somebody do the math for me. Katie, do the math. How many people is that for each of us? 100 people? 10 people? God, my God, I'm bad. But that's not very many people. We could easily reach the entire population of Bloomer in a short amount of time if we would just go out and talk to a few people. Right? We could go up and help New Auburn reach every person in their community because they only got 550, right? So just imagine if we worked for us, my gosh, there shouldn't be a person in these two communities that hasn't heard about Jesus. Now, not everyone's going to accept the invitation, right? It does, the text doesn't say that everybody in the province of Asia started coming to Paul's church, but I guarantee you almost every person that Paul could get his hands on heard about Jesus from either himself or from his disciples. So my friends, let us go out and let us find ways to do it. And here's, the, here's one other thing I want to add quick before I, I end. If you really need opportunities to share your testimony, I'm going to invite you to pray for them. Say, God, send somebody my way that I can minister to. And I guarantee you, you will have that opportunity. Now again, 
be very careful what you pray for. Because sometimes the ministry God calls you to isn't always an easy one. And the person that God sends to you might not be an easy one. But I can tell you it would be worth it to minister to that person. And I can tell you that I've done that even recently, and God has just kind of blown my socks off. Because in the last six months, I've had more people come up and ask questions, ask for pastoral counseling. I've had the opportunity to disciple more people, including my kids, right? I mean, I, I'm watching the little kids we have here in Kidzillion and in Sunday school and even my own. Some of those kids could preach. Some of those kids can pray, right? They're amazing. I look at what's going on in some of your lives, and it's amazing. You guys are not the same people that you were when I came here six years ago. And I don't just mean that we have a few more gray hairs and a couple more wrinkles, Okay, I mean, I have seen good spiritual growth in many of you, and that is awesome. It's been such a privilege and an honor, honor to, to be your pastor in that. And my prayer for us, for you as individuals and us as a church, is that we just continue to, to fan that spark, to fan those flames, so that we do go out and be the light in this community that God has called us to. Right, You guys have a history of a strong presence in this community, and we're going to continue doing that. So just step deeper. Pray for those opportunities, and don't be afraid to share your testimony and to share God's love with the people that are in your path. My friends, God bless. <clears throat> friends, at this time, I'm going to invite us to move into a, a time of prayer and if there are things that you would like to lift up and share with us, I invite you to do so at this time. Marianne. So prayers for Marianne's brother Chuck as he is in the hospital. Prayers for healing and recovery. Colin. Yeah, that this time of the year it can be kind of tricky, can it? But I'm glad you had fun at your birthday party. And hopefully we'll get a sunny day and a warm day soon. Man. I have a former co-worker, uh, Kirsten Thompson. Um, she is going through breast cancer right now that is that, and she's on her second round of chemo. So prayers for, for Kirsten, who is undergoing breast cancer treatment. We know that that can be a very difficult process. So prayers of healing for her and recovery. I believe it is, is it also Breast Cancer Awareness Month? So let's just lift up all of those, those women that are dealing with that issue. But thank you for sharing that. Trajan. So the joys of, of having good grandparents who can take care of you and you get to spend time with them, that's a blessing. Anita. Um, I have a brand new great granddaughter who was born last Tuesday and she's perfect. Um, my children's father um, is doing much, much better and he's been removed and moved to a rehab facility. And my house was roofed last weekend and nobody <laughs> All right, so lots of stuff there. So praise on the new addition to your family and, and praise for um, the recovering of your family member and thank goodness your roof's done and everybody's safe in the process. So. I have a personal uh, prayer of uh, thankfulness that uh, a couple of special people prayed over me a couple weeks ago and I Better Good. Well, praise God for that. Absolutely. Amen. Oh, 
Clayton. You have your chicken coop and the chickens are all good? You collecting the eggs? And lots of hay? Oh, 10 a day. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. You can get big and strong on that many a day. Maybe one day your dad will have to show you the Rocky movie and show you how to really eat those. <laughs> well, blessings on the, on the animals that are in our lives and the joys that they bring. So thank you for sharing. Jess. So prayers for the ceremony that Jess will be putting on for her students and congratulations on the achievements and things that they have done. Yes, Olivia. Uh, for, for Kim and John, they're going to be traveling to uh, Texas next week or this coming week. So travel mercies for Kim and John as they head down south. Hopefully it's a little warmer down there than it is up here. Well, enjoy your trip. Sarah. I believe it's Abby's birthday tomorrow. And thanks for just all the prayers for our time away and success. Amen. So, yep, my little niece, Evelyn, she has a birthday coming up, I believe. Well, yesterday was, yesterday was her birthday? Yep. How old are you? Four. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, happy birthday to you, my dear. Was there one other one, Dale? I have two actually for prayers for healing and, and guidance for the surgeons and things. My brother, issues with my uh, gallbladder that was removed, and ductwork. I guess you could call it ductwork inside between there and the pancreas. Uh, and then my brother-in-law has a heart rhythm problem where one part of it is firing too often and they're going to do a surgery where they go in and burn that nerve to stop it from cycling too much. Okay. But they're both doing very well. So. Okay. Well, we're glad that they're doing well, but prayers for your family as they go through those things. Polly. Yes, prayers of peace and reconciliation for the people of Israel and Palestine, as well as for Ukraine and for Russia. Anything else this morning? Well, friends, I'm going to invite you to take these things or anything else that may be on your heart and mind in a moment of silent prayer. Dear gracious and loving God, 
we just thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in this place where we can worship you freely. Lord, we pray that we have glorified you through every aspect of this service. And Lord, we thank you that you call us to go out into the world and to be a light, to share your love and grace with other people and to begin to disciple them. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just call us deeper and that we would not be afraid of going beyond our comfort zones, knowing that when we walk obediently, there's something powerful, there's joy, there's vibrant life to be found in you. Lord, help us to be a discipling church, to live out our mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Lord, this day we thank you and we praise you for all of the good things that are going on in the life of our faith community. Lord, we thank you for birthdays, for healing, for recovery, for new additions to family, for the animals that bring us joy. And Lord, we lift up so many people right now that are struggling with health concerns. And so we pray for Mary Ann's brother Chuck. We pray for Kirsten as well as the other women dealing with breast cancer. We pray for Dale's brother and brother-in-law as they go through their procedures and we just ask for healing upon them. Lord, we ask for peace and reconciliation in places like Israel and Palestine, Russia and Ukraine. And Lord, we pray for travel mercies for those who will be going out to different places. And Lord, we pray that there may be opportunities not only for them, but for each and every one of us in this coming week to share your love and grace with someone in some way. Lord, we ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please join me in our Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, at this time, let us join together in our closing song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. It is number 170 in your hymnal. We will sing the first two verses. I invite you to stand if you can comfortably do so.
My friends, I invite you to join me in this responsive benediction. Once we were not a people, now we are God's people. Once our souls were parched from thirst, but now we go satisfied, fed by God's spiritual milk. Once our hearts were troubled, now they rest secure. My friends, go with the grace and love of God in Jesus' name. Amen.